Um, I, I want to go back to just your technique and talk about what I feel is unique about you as well, and that is uh, you are one of the few drummers that I have had the opportunity to work with and to, to be able to kind of hear things in my head and to say, hey, what about this? What if you tried this out? And um, I worked with a lot of drummers and, and the problem is that I'm not a drummer. And so when I have an idea of a beat, that drummer, that, that beat is, might not be possible to play in the way that I think it is because I don't know how it would be. I just kind of hear it in my head. So the, the drummer's job then is to try and fit, translate that into a left and right hand with a kick, snare, hi-hat, and toms or whatever they're playing. And yeah. um, you have been one of the best people to record and write with because whenever I have an idea, I can suggest it and you can immediately play it. Whereas I worked with other drummers where I'll suggest an idea and they'll try it and try it. No, 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 that's not it. Do this. And they'll try it and try it. And when they finally get it, I go, okay, yeah, that's it. But it didn't sound good. So scratch my idea. It wasn't a very good <laughs> idea anyway. And so you have this way of just immediately kind of entering into the process with me, offering your own ideas. And so I felt, I always feel like we work very fast. And one of those beats that kind of has been a future of forestry beat that drummers have loved is slow your breath down. Do you remember... Yeah. Um, the process of, of creating that beat together? Yeah, I've I've told a few people about this before too because a lot of times um, people that that listen to something and, and like a beat or something would assume that the drummer just comes up with it. And so, you know, it's not uncommon that I'll get a question like, hey, how, you know, how did you come up with that beat? And I'm like, I don't know. I did like it. It wasn't. I would. I didn't come up with that. Like we. It was kind of this weird back and forth thing of adding and taking away, and um, we were on different sides of the glass. And so you, you know, you were hearing it through the speakers, and I was at the drums. And we decided, I think, pretty early on, we were like, "Oh, it would be sweet if in verse two this big like organ drops in, and we kind of do like a halftime kind of." you know, beat drop kind of thing. So we started messing around with it. And it was like, if you think about, I mean, it's, it is what it is. So it's hard to think about it other ways, but you know, picture the first chorus ending and just going into like, <laughs> you know, it'd be like, Oh, that's, that was a weird choice, you know? Yeah. But I think that's where we started. It was like, try, I think you were probably like, let's try like a halftime thing. And then, it was like, okay. And then I think it turned into like, oh, can you add more bass drum hits? So it's not just do, 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 do. So then it was like, okay, let's add like a do, 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 do. Hopefully it's okay that I'm mouth drumming here. But, um, yeah, it's fantastic. Anyway, if you want, I could pull up a keyboard patch and do some keyboard <laughs> drumming. Um, no, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then I think the, the cool thing about the way that your ears work is you'll, like you said, you'll think about, oh, Hey, what if you added like something here and the drummer, the drummer mind goes, oh, I like, that's, that's absurd. You know, like I, that's, that wasn't in any of my, you know, studies. <laughs> and so you have to like break outside of it. And, um, and so eventually it was just kind of like. And you're good at, at doing this, like with uh, vocalizing. You might say through the talkback mic, like, "What if you did like a boom, boom, got boom, boom," you know? And then it's like, "Oh, oh yeah, that'd be cool." Kind of like a like a syncopated thing. Um, so that's so the then, only because I don't even remember all, most of the stuff that you're talking about. I do remember that part and the boom, boom, got boom, and then like just saying yeah, more kicks, and that's where it became boom, yeah, boom, got boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. Did, did I do it that right? Yep. Or... Yeah. So here's, and the then... par here's the amazing part, though. I remember feeling like, hey, that's sounding pretty cool. But I remember saying, but can you throw in 16th notes? So that's where oh, yeah. most drummers would stop and they would probably attempt to do kind of the disco tick, 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 beat, you know. But instead, yeah. you just had your, your one hand your right hand do the little bounce thing 
Is that yeah? Is that correct? I, at some point too, we decided that it would be cool to um to open the hi hat on the downbeat. You know. Oh yeah, but, I forgot about that. And then, and so we had that. But then you were like, "Can you like add? Can you make the hi hat part busier? Like it feel? I feel like it needs sixteenth notes. Right. And somehow, just it became a thing where we added the like the triples, um, which again. I think that technique came from studying the molar technique because you learn how to be efficient with your um, with your finger control and stuff and your bounces. But um, and then it was like we wanted to keep that sixteenth note thing going, but you don't want it to be you don't want it to be all in the hi hat. Right. So then we started adding the ghost notes on the snare, and so the hi hat and the snare are working together to kind of give that sixteenth note feel, and then. When you go to the 16th notes on the hi-hat, you stop the ghost notes on the snare kind of a thing. So these are the TJ Eric conversations that we have where we geek out over like one simple beat. And I'm sure there are people who are just like, how long are they going to be talking about this? But this is kind of what makes future <laughs> forestry and what makes it so much fun is the time and thought that, that goes into these things. And in the end, it just comes out with a cool sound, but it didn't happened by accident it came yeah with a lot of deliberation and a lot of thought and a lot of experimentation and and that is of the like in numerous um lessons and things that i learned just from kind of being in the studio with you i, I feel like there's so many things that i do every day just making music that i'm like i learn. you know if i think back i'm like oh i I either saw Eric do this and I'm just like copying him now or he like, you know, or you like actually told me about it. But one of the things that I learned was um, to not give up quickly on parts. Like typically if you're if you're at a certain skill level with instruments, it's easy to be like, OK, so we've got like a, a little chord progression here and I want a lead guitar part. So then you pick up a guitar and you go like, no, 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 no. And you're like, oh, okay, that's fine. And you just do that and you're like, okay, lead guitar done. <laughs> you know, and then working with you in the studio, you'll be like, I feel like this one note, it needs to go somewhere else. And then the like lazy musician, like just player, like it's good enough guy in me is going like, but it's fine, you know. And so I think I you you helped me learn how to push past the like just good enough mentality and get to a point where every note is there for a reason. Um and sometimes those notes do happen by accident, but then you stop and go like that note that you hit there was like actually really cool. Like do that again. Um but it's not just like you know, the way your mind works is I don't think I've ever seen you settle for like okay, that's good enough. You'll like keep pushing and keep pushing and I remember on um close your eyes we were working on that mandolin part. And I remember almost being like frustrated at how long it was taking. But then by the end, it's like this mandolin part is so cool on the chorus. I was like, every note is fun to play. Like once you get it down and it's like, it's interacting with the melody in a cool way. And there's so much, um, you know, intention behind every, every note. That was something that I have really picked up from learning or from being in the studio with you. Well, thank you for being patient enough to um, endure my anal retentativeness and to <laughs> that's to the name of the uh, next album right yes yes it is but to to experience the end result together because we are able to look at a history of albums which you've probably yeah. played on i don't know five or more of and um and to be to be proud of it to say yeah these are parts that were really really happy with um which kind of leads me to something else we have in common and that is recognizing kind of where we are in the process where we are emotionally and and the importance of that in order to make great music um yeah so can you tell tell me and everybody just a little bit about the role that music has pay, has played in the past and present relating to you as a musician and as a healthy person um, as someone who um, cares about about creating um, as as a healthy uh, as a healthy creator yeah uh, 
I believe that um, being a healthy musician, healthy creator, um, and a healthy person are connected. Um, I think a lot of people, and I went through years of this, they kind of have a, a kind of codependent relationship with music where they're like unhealthy and sometimes self-destructive patterns and decisions um, can lead them to really like low places and out of those low places is where you find inspiration you know like it's really hard to write like you know a super peppy song when you're happy but for some reason it's easy to write like a really like gut-wrenching song when you're like super bummed you know (laughs) and so I think a lot of times because the inspiration for a lot of musicians tends to come um in the valleys of life and not as much on the mountaintops, uh, you can end up creating a situation where you create your own valley and you can just be in there. And, uh, it's, um, it can be not the best place and it can be, it can start to lead you down some, um, some kind of scary or, or, um, just low, roads and so I think you were the first person to tell me this you said you're like before I start my work every day if I'm bummed out or something's going on in my head I take the time to figure out what's going on and to honor the emotions but to figure out kind of what's going on and for me it it's turned into this thing where I've had to learn how to kind of cultivate like a level of awareness like a present state awareness where if I have to sit down and I've got a deadline or if I'm just writing something and I'm feeling like in a funk, instead of just powering through like I used to, I'll like take some time and just be quiet and um, and just figure out what's going on and be like, what's going on in my head and like where am I feeling it in my body? Because a lot of times people think a lot about emotions and feelings but there's a physical connection too. And and I heard somebody say that people will say this kind of thing, that they identify the physical, the body connection without realizing it. They'll say like, oh, I've got butterflies in my tum- tummy or I've got like, I just feel like I've just got a lump in my throat or I've got, you know what I mean? There's kind of this, there is a physical like body connection. And so sometimes I'll sit there and I'll get quiet, take some deep breaths, um, and just be like, kind of do a body scan, just go from head to toe and just be like, what's going on here? And usually by the end, I can pinpoint like, oh, I've got this like dread feeling in my stomach. And it's because I said this to this person and I'm scared that they thought that I meant this. It it usually ends up being something really dumb, but it just builds up. And, um, and once I kind of you know, honor the emotion and honor what's going on, but then be like, okay, like I'm letting it go. Um, then I find the creative process can move forward a lot better because I'm not creating out of a place of like, life sucks and I'm mad, but I don't know why, but I'm just going to make music. It's like getting rid of all that and then creating from a place of just peace, you know? Yeah, peace and which is gives birth to creativity. So I, I relate to that and I'm curious for you, what what's it like when you don't go through that process? So if there's some if there's a level of anxiety going on, and instead of addressing it, you just head for work. You head for work, meaning you head to create music. What happens to you when when you don't address those feelings? Uh, it's it's weird because a lot of times the the music itself isn't all that different, but my state is, and I'll get. I'll get to the end of the day and instead of feeling fulfilled and like, oh, you know, if I was a sled dog, like being like the dog that's like, I pulled the sled today. (laughs) I'm more just like the slave dog. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? I I always like to say, like, if you've ever watched any of those cheesy sled dog movies, when the, the sled dog driver comes out in the morning, they're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get to pull the sled today. Um, anyway, so sometimes I think about that. So you enjoy the process. uh, yeah, you actually enjoy the process and you you don't feel that frantic state in that frantic state of just like I've got to get this done as quick as possible because you know 
I'm right. mad or <laughs> whatever. So I've noticed a complete difference in efficiency. Like when my when my state of mind is in a peaceful place or when it's not. I've noticed, and this is kind of a trigger for me, but if I'm ever working on a certain section of a song, if I'm kind of like hitting play and it's like I'm almost like on this like loop cycle where I'm like hitting play and I'll do this to it and then I'll hit play and I'll do this to it and it just keeps going on and it goes very fast. If I find myself in that like loop cycle, I I have to, that's when it's like, oh, wait a minute. I don't think I'm going anywhere. I don't think I'm creating anything. I don't think I'm yeah. like, I don't think I'm doing anything good right now. I'm just adding a bunch of tracks or like tweaking stuff and just getting more <laughs> frustrated. Yeah. And, and I remember even, even years and years ago, we were working on, I forget which album it was, but we were just having one of those moments, but communally where it was just just beating a dead horse and then picking up the horse's carcass and then beating it again, <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that was a gross example, but, um, we'll say it's a rubber, like a rubber horse, uh, so that it doesn't seem graphic. Um, and you were like, <laughs> you like stopped, you, you hit the space bar on Pro Tools and you're like, you want to go see a movie? <laughs> and so we went and saw a movie and it was like that. I learned that day. I was like, sometimes the best thing you can do is just take a break, go for a walk, go see a movie, um, find some inspiration, whatever, you know. If you leave, I'll still be close to you. 